Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us at this brown bag. Um, let me take off my mask so I can speak clearly. Um, the consortium is a wonderful opportunity to build on work that's been ongoing for years in terms of common data elements. Um, common data elements for me has become a framework to operationalize a lot of larger theoretical concepts that I've been working on for over 30 years. So I'm really excited that NIH has emphasized the CDE element. So we're gonna go through some things that may seem unrelated, but it all drills down to why we wanna have common data elements. And I wanna thank Maggie and Megan and Amy who have all actively participated both in the development of the grant and the intellectual guidance of everything we're doing within the consortium. So, building blocks. Interoperability, that's a term I've been using for a couple of years now, but that is why we're interested in CDEs. We have to work towards CDEs, but we have to go through a series of stages to reach that important point. So I always think of this as an inverted pyramid. We start with very broad theoretical concepts and drill down to a way to operationalize these concepts into something that's useful for a research or an analysis. And it all begins with superpopulation data. I've been playing with superpopulation data for about three decades. And essentially, it's the idea that all surveys, all administrative data, all studies, all community surveys are drawn from the same infinite superpopulation of data. So in theory, and that's in quotes for a reason, we should be able to organize all surveys, all samples, all data sets into a single unified analysis set. Um, what we have to do and what the trick of superpopulation theory is identifying the distribution. There's a lot of Bayesian work that goes into that. Um, Dr. Little over at the Biostats, he's done some really fascinating work with superpopulation. But this is the big idea. The big idea that we're not an archive of individual studies, we're a study. And if we can discover a way to unify all these studies we've collected over the last 60 years across time and space and questions, then we can treat it as a single research project. And to me, that's really exciting. That's, that's cool. It's not possible, but in theory, it's, it's something that sort of drives a lot of the way I think about data. How can we compare data? How do we harmonize data? How do we look at data across studies and time and draw conclusions about the way things have changed and the way things have stayed the same? Um, interoperability itself begins at the most basic level. And this is, this is preaching to the choir the next couple of slides. We're all very familiar with all these issues. We want to identify, catalog, and organize information about variables and data design. We want metadata. We have best archival practices, which, you know, this, this is what we do best archival practices. We help people organize information in a way that makes it easier for use in independent research. Um, I recently did a talk on this at an Alzheimer's meeting, so you're gonna see AD, ADRD in there occasionally. Um, we've also done it for the National Cancer Institute. Um, Maggie, in fact, was one of the first things she did when joining us was to get funding from NIH to look at ways to organize surveys and studies into common data elements. And it was, it was a very nice proof of concept, and we have some software that was developed and we may be able to evolve it further. So a lot of people have been working on this at ICPSR, and now it's a chance to unify all these ideas and thoughts into a solid product. Um, this has been going on since the late 1990s at ICPSR. One of the first things I did when I joined ICPSR was to talk to the director at the time, Richard Rockwell, about this idea. And from that, the variable database evolved. 
this idea that we can start treating information collectively across studies. We don't treat them as independent, isolated instances, but we can start to compare and contrast information. It's a slow process. It's going to outlive me by decades. I mean, this is just such a massive but fascinating undertaking, and I'm hoping other people will get excited about the idea. So it will continue on. Um, you know, metadata, it's data about data. We know all this. This is what the standard ICPSR website looks like. It provides information about the study. It has all these very nice organizational tools the at a glance, data documentation, variables, et cetera. We've done an excellent job of organizing individual data sets into usable components that a researcher can access and use. And one of the compliments I hear about ICPSR constantly is they like the fact that once they've used one ICPSR data set, they can use any ICPSR data set. And that is not true with most other archives, uh, Dataverse, et cetera, or other open source units, you have to, discoverability becomes a problem, usability becomes a problem. So this has been a huge success for us. And then variables, this is the next step. Metadata is nice, variables are better. Being able to look at individual variables within a study and then begin to look at individual variables across studies. This is where we start to get some progress in moving towards common data elements. I mean, we've got, goodness, almost six million variables identified at ICPSR. And we can look at six million variables <laughs> and decide how they relate to each other, how they cross across time and place. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. The variable database has just been an incredible success story, and it gives us a foundation upon which we can grow and evolve into many more exciting things as we start to organize this information systematically. And then, you know, search results. We know this. Again, I'm preaching to the choir here. You put in... in progress. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, you put in a question like cognition, you get a list of studies, you get a list of variables, you get a list of series, publications, websites that have information on cognition. Putting it all together into a single comparable package is the next step. We can find things, we're discoverable. We've done a great job of organizing the foundation of information. And uh, same thing for Alzheimer's. But it all comes down to interoperability. It would be wonderful if we had CDEs, but if we don't use them for something useful, then what's the point? And this is one of the goals of the consortium as well, to not force, but to guide people into using similar measures that are comparable across studies. Um, we don't want people creating their own measures, if humanly possible, because we know from methodological research that the slightest change in question text can result in rather dramatic changes in response rates and outcomes. So again, interoperability is the use of a single means of communication to access multiple competing services. This is the sort of CNSE kind of definition of interoperability but it allows us to start to look across dis cross disciplinary research, start to look at social determinants of health models, look at population health models, because we can look at studies that have similar designs, similar variables. Um, the three key elements and the things we do well is how we release data and how we share it, how to use the external sources of data with these data, and how well infrastructure supports the long tail of science, which is, we've cornered the market on long tail efficiencies for data. Um, we invest a lot early on, making the data usable, making it accessible, and then the cost of sharing drop down significantly. It's that initial investment that makes ICPSR stand out from other archives, that we have created a standardized model for information that we can build on and continue to expand, continue to improve across time. So, we've got variables, 
we've got metadata, we've got data. Now we have to create consensus. We have to get people to agree that common data elements are the ones they want to use. Um, common data elements, or CDEs as they often are known, are standardized key terms or concepts. They're used primarily in clinical research at the moment, and they enhance data quality so that similar questions can be used across studies and sites. Um, CDEs support standardization of terms. That's sort of the key purpose of CDEs. Um, they facilitate data sharing because data can be compared and combined across studies. If you have different questions, then you have to make decisions. This is the tragedy of the commons when you start talking about harmoniza harmonization. It's insanely expensive because everybody has a slightly different way of asking the same question. If everybody asked the question the same way, it'd be much easier to harmonize it. Um, Dr. Spittle, who Maggie has worked with, um, made an observation to me at a meeting that he wants a DSM of behavioral and social science CDEs. He wants people to sit down in groups, subject experts, and decide what what means. We had a very nice presentation uh, last month, or two months ago, was it, on uh, gender identification at one of the consortium meetings where one of the scholars gave a very thorough and interesting discussion of how our measurement of gender has changed across time and what are the implications of that for research. Uh, anyone who's a demographer knows the transitions we went through um, a couple of decades ago when self-ascribed race was allowed and we had to revise our way of thinking about race to include biracial, triracial, different combinations. And uh, while it made our nice naive models of change uh, outmoded, it's enhanced and enriched our understanding of how the world works. And the same as in terms of gender, marriage, a number of social and behavioral variables are changing in response to changing social behaviors. So we don't have a DSM for social and behavioral and economic research. We don't have the kind of agreement at the present time that many of the biomedical people, but then they deal in much more straightforward measurement issues, scales, lab tests, uh, things that can be measured explicitly. It's much easier to come to a consensus there. We're talking about social behaviors. What is poverty? What is hunger? What is sickness? What is disability? These are all things that are debatable and debated constantly. And this is one of the reasons why it would be nice through this project to start getting groups of content experts to sit down and talk among themselves and say, this we agree for the science is what this is measuring at the present time. And like the DSM, as things change, you adapt and update the common data elements. You have new definitions, new measurements. So that's a pretty exciting idea. Um, it, it, like so many things, it's slow. Um, one of the ways we're moving towards this is by examining data pools and question banks. We're looking for the COVID consortium at different studies that collect information on COVID, on policy, on, as Maggie was talking earlier, about mask use in a variety of topics. Do they ask it the same way? If they do, great. If they don't, why not? Why, why can't we come to a consensus about some of these measures? Because without consistent measures, outcomes become less meaningful because then you have the problem of bias, um, response issues, all the things that make it more difficult for us to do our, our work. Um, the, the, big, the big kahuna, the, the major player in this CDE role is National Library of Medicine at NIH. They've been working at this for a number of years. They have a very nice searchable website. Um, you can search for specific kinds of CDEs. You can look, 
they've, they've started a new program where they put a gold seal. When they say this is the best measure at the present time, they put a gold seal next to it. So you know that's the one that NIH is recommending using. Um, there's also forms, you can do advanced search. It's nice, but again, this focus on biomedical research has consequences. They started it, they own it, that's fair. Uh, they don't care about poverty, they don't care about marital status as much as we do. But it does have implication for what's available. Uh, for example, if you put the word poverty into the CD at the National Library of Medicine, you get no results. There are no approved measures of poverty. At, yeah, exactly. I mean, this, this is where we can make a difference. This is where we can bring change to the system by starting to introduce things that as social scientists, we consider to be essential to understanding health and all the other things. I mean, this, this is kind of embarrassing, um, such a common, uh, you get the same response for marital status as well. Um, also, uh, it's a little tricky, like a lot of search engines, uh, you have to use quotes. If you were to just put in marital status, you would get every status variable in the uh, CDE repository. So you have to learn the system. It's a rabbit hole. There's lots of good stuff in here, but, it's not intuitive. Um, another example is the Finex toolkit, um, which is another NIH uh, supported group. They seem to have more social and behavioral research variables, but it's imperfect. Uh, again, when we put poverty in here, we get, you know, okay, this is fine, annual family income. Is that poverty? Not exactly. You're going to have to manipulate it to find out what, how that falls into a poverty. And then they have this one here, which is the American Community Survey. It's actually kind of interesting because it's not a measure per se. It's an outline of the steps you take using the American Community Survey to create a concentrated disadvantage measure. And that's kind of cool, but because it's not standardized, you know, you make choices. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll drop missing data or I'll impute missing data or I'll set missing data to the mean. There can be considerable variation in outcomes and concentrated poverty and childhood poverty. I mean, these are all nice, but are they poverty? Are they a standard measure we can all use? They're, I, they're concepts. So there's work that needs to be done. But if you want to know um, blood levels for diabetics, well, both of these websites are the place to go. Uh, gold standard all the way. Um, we also have information. This one has been quite popular, particularly among a number of the funded studies in the consortium. Um, the state policy database coming out of Boston. Um, this is a very nice tool. They've gone through and collected at the state level whenever possible policy interventions. Schools closing, mask requirements, restaurant closing, various things. And they also have outcome measures. So mortality, hospitalizations. It comes in an Excel spreadsheet, which, you know, okay, fine. We can work with that. But again, it's, it's, it allows them to update it quite frequently, and they do, which is wonderful. But it's a tool we can probably evolve and present more effectively to the research community, particularly you know, identifying the core variables they're using that could be turned into CDEs, and to introduce those as standard questions that are useful, because we're seeing this across states. It also allows us to see variation across states. Are all the states asking this the same way? If yes, that's wonderful. If not, why not? Again, it's all variation. It's all differences in the way questions are wording. That's the enemy of a common data element. Our goal is to get people comfortable with the idea that there's a standard way to ask questions, and it works and it provides useful information.
Um, other major U.S. projects have also begun looking at COVID issues. Um, and hats and PSID, they ask questions. We're comparing those questions. They're not always the same because there's, there's always a little bit of uniqueness from different studies. But we can work with that. We can, we can discuss how to make that better. HRS, uh, they've done a special COVID panel and they are introducing a series of standardized COVID questions into future waves of the HRS. And because they're introducing a set of standardized questions, that is an opportunity for us to examine what they're asking and perhaps recommend it because HRS is, for at least for aging research, that's where people go. So there are opportunities out there. Our job is to organize, evaluate, catalog, and review all this information and then share it in a consistent manner. And that's, that's the hard work, but that's the work we do. We work with data, we make it better. Um, I like this place. Maggie pointed this out to me a while ago and it organizes, you can, put in different search terms, but it tries to keep track of different groups that are asking questions about COVID. And so it's all laid out for you. And they also sell the software as an organizational tool. We looked into it and unfortunately they're not ADA compliant, nor do they plan to be ADA compliant. So it makes it difficult for us to use it as a software tool, but it is a nice, if you're interested and you go to this um, archive, you can start to see different ways people ask questions about COVID because almost everybody got into the COVID bandwagon at some point or another. And it's our job <laughs> to review, catalog, organize and evaluate all of this bandwagon. And you know, we're in year one, we'll get there. Um, consensus, how many people are agreeing? This is where we really start to break down. Um, I've been working on this for a little while, done a couple of presentations, both in terms of the COVID consortium and also some of the aging work and a few other things. Um, so this, this, this gives you a feel for how CDEs are organized at the National Library of Medicine who is the player. Um, NINDS, Phoenix, Heart, Lung and Blood. Um, NIA is way down here in the corner with just a little tiny piece of CDEs. NICHD, that's still quite small compared to these other groups. So again, the major funders of social and behavioral research are not really players in the overall CDE landscape at the present time. But we're going to change that because we will. Um, similarly, if we look at National Library of Medicine publications on COVID, um, RNA, glycoprotein, risk factors, healthcare, uh, Well, if you can find social, so, social science research in this, you're better than I am. I believe it falls somewhere in this other topic. And it's similar. Um, Elizabeth Moss has done some wonderful work refining the uh, PubMed search to try and narrow down the 30, 40,000 publications on COVID into a couple of thousands publications that focus on social and behavioral economic research. That's the uphill battle. You know, we're not interested, we're interested in, you know, biomedical research generally, but our goal is to be a player and to introduce social science research as a consistent tool. And to do that, we want CDEs that show up in a search. Um, this is some runs I did recently for uh, Duke University. And if we look at cognition, we can see NIA is a huge player in cognition, as is mental health and NICHD um, and other groups. But here we see, as you would expect, NIH funding for cognition, NIA is the main player. Same thing for Alzheimer's. 
So we've got all this wonderful stuff, but if we start to break it down into NIH studies that look at cognition, we see NIA falls way down. Um, and the other groups start to come up, including NIDA. Um, so here's cognition-related CDEs, which again, I did for Duke. And here, instead of NIA, it's NDS that is the big player, and heart, lung, and blood promise few others. So you can see the focus on the biomedical measurement of cognition. Um, Alzheimer-related CDEs. Again, where is NIA in this play? Because NIA funds a lot of social and behavioral and economic research. So does NICHD, but they're not players. It's, pl it's the biomedical people that are cornering the CDE list. So, ignoring all that, because we know we've got work ahead of us, but we know how to do it. How are we gonna to start to do this? How are we gonna start creating CDEs and introduce interoperability among studies, COVID and otherwise? I mean, COVID is our opportunity to build a proof of concept model that will impress funders, that will show that we can do it, that we're the main player in this game. Um, one approach is to use the DDI XML standard. We're not advocating any particular standard at this time. There's a lot of debate and discussion about how we're gonna go about this. We've just been using DDI for a while. NACTA has been using DDI lifecycle for a bit. Um, these tools work. It was developed quite a while ago by a National Science Foundation grant and ICPSR was a founding matter of DDI. Um, we like it because it's standard, and this is what people like. They like standardized documentation, they like standardized search tools, they like standardized variables. Um, one of the reasons I like the life course is, again, this nested model, where we can go from a very broad concept, such as COVID, and come down through conceptual variables, represented variables, and instance variables, actual measures. So who wore a mask? COVID, who wore a mask? It makes it more discoverable because you start with broad concepts and then you're guided by search tools into more and more refined concepts. Sanda, Jared, and I have had lots of discussions. I usually use the uh, variable cascade incorrectly, but I use it theoretically in my own mind and practically Sanda and Jared understand how it actually works. But it's a nice idea, again, these nested models that we grew up with, particularly if you're a demographer, nested models are the way to go. You like geography and everything fitting nicely into each other. So this is one possible tool. Um, we also have an excellent um, CNS group who are building Data Model 3, which I don't fully understand yet, but Amy is, is, is quite excited about, and as is Maggie, so that may in fact resolve our problems. Because right now, who knows? I, we do things, and it takes a while, but when it's finally done, it's usually pretty cool, and it works. And you know, it's this anticipation, but anyway. In order to build interoperability data for CDEs, it starts with, again, what we do, an exhausted list of the variables across the studies we're interested in. We go in, we rip the data set apart, we look at it in its most minimal elements, and we start comparing. That has to be done. You cannot do it any other way. There's no shortcuts. This is long tail. This is the initial investment that has long-term payoff in terms of migrating data to new to new servers and all sorts of things, but you gotta do the groundwork. Um, the metadata team, they will list the variables across waves and studies. They identify variable matches, non-matches, and things for secondary review. This gives us a draft crosswalk. It gives us a visual 
tool we can use to evaluate. And one of the things we've developed over the past few years working on this with uh, NIH funding is the idea that harmonization is not a yes, no answer, it's a distribution. There are different levels of harmonization from a perfect match to no match at all. Uh, one of the classic examples is height. If you measure height in inches, that's one measure. If you measure height in feet and inches, you can create a variable that matches the height in inches, or you can go the other way. So you can make those harmonize perfectly. It's just a little extra work, and then sometimes there's just no way to compare them. Um, this is an example that Sonda did for us looking across NSHAP and NHAT. So NIA funded us to look at cognitive variables. And being us, uh, we did both data sets entirely uh, rather than just pick out the handful of variables. So we actually did a variable by variable comparison of NHAT and NSHAP and started looking at these different types of comparability, one to many, directly comparable, needs harmonization, um, related concepts. There's a working paper on this on, uh, on the uh, Michigan Blue, where Sonda explains in some detail how, how this was developed. And I like it because, you know, you, you can't force harmonization when it's not there, but you can think about ways that things are related to each other. If you think distributionally rather than um, as a yes, no variable, then it gives you a whole lot more options and opportunities to do good research. So there's been, you know, in the background, we've been doing this on and off, but the consortium gives us the opportunity to really focus and promote and push this information out to the research community so they start getting comfortable with the idea that this is a good way to do research. Um, this is just an example of the output using uh, the Collectica system, which NACTA uses um, because that's what's available, but we would love to internalize it. But anyway, it just, looks at each variable across the three waves of NSHAP, the eight waves of NHATS, and it finds variables. So self-rated mental health, they're related, they're not perfect. Um, cognitive impairment, that's a many to one. That's where you've got multiple, you break down one variable into discrete parts, but you can, organize it into a one variable and match it across the two variables. So that, that was nice. That, that, you know, again, this is sort of our proof of concept. It takes a while to get people used to the idea because it's new. Um, how do we grow this? How do we actually operationalize this into a useful system that has punch, that's discoverable, that has meaning to the broader research community? I get excited about it, but I get excited about superpopulation and everybody just looks at me like I'm crazy. Um, but tools, operationalization, outputs, measures, People get excited about that. A lot of times they don't care about the broad theoretical issues, but they do care about being able to do good research more efficiently and more effectively. Um, when I was training in forensics a long time ago, uh, we used to have somebody called the wound man, uh, who was just a representation of all the terrible things we can do to other people. And we can think of data in the same way, that each one of these wounds is a wound to the data sampling bias, poorly validated questions. Respondents lie, they lie all the time. It'll drive you nuts. Not much you can do about it, but you have to recognize the fact. Um, when the uh, family growth survey was looking at partner data, lifetime partner data, uh, men and women had remarkably different answers when they should have been comparable um, because respondents lie. Uh, there's power issues, really weird sampling designs, convenient samples, so, um, things like that. So we have, to, we have to consider all of these problems as we think about comparability and how we're going to build common data elements. We have to be aware of the problems so we can offer solutions. And you know, as researchers who work with data on a day-to-day -day basis, 
we know all the problems. And most of the time, our curators do a wonderful job of resolving conflicts and problems in the data. So, you know, it's, it's just part of what we do. But it's not something other people think about a lot. And whether we want them to think about it or not, eh, we'll see. But if we're aware, we can do a better job and help them do better research. Um, then there's the resistance issues. Um, social, behavioral, and economic research. We have a long history of sharing data. We've been sharing data forever, but other disciplines, not so much. Epidemiologists, we've made progress. We, we've got a lot of cooperation. When I came 20 years ago, an epidemiologist would run away from you as fast as you, as fast as they could if you mentioned sharing their data. Psychology, eh. The biomedical people, we're making progress. Clinical trials, NIH is gonna crack down on clinical trials because their refusal to share their information is outrageous and quite, quite frankly unethical in many ways. Um, we need to be able to validate their research. So we've got all of these issues that we have to come over, overcome as ICPSR to get people to work with us. And we, we know how to do this. We know how to talk to people. We know how to make people understand the benefits of data sharing. And in this case, I mean, the beauty of the consortium, we don't really want their data all that bad. We want their variables. We want to know how they're asking questions and what kind of fields they have. So it's, a, it's an almost a fundamentally easier it's a way of easing them into the idea of sharing data. We don't want your data, we want your questions because you're brilliant. And I'll tell you, psychologists, man, they ask brilliant questions. Good Lord, their ability to write good questions. They, you know, you look at some of the ways they structure questions, it's just, it's mind boggling. It makes you feel <laughs> totally untrained and, and incapable. <laughs> but, uh, if we can overcome this resistance, it, it lets us do population health research. I mean, we need all of the pieces. We need the PPI. We need the behavioral and social economic survey data. We need biomedical. We need biomarker. And we need this information because it tells us about health outcomes. Why did some people die of COVID and some people walk away unscathed? Why were there economic and geo graphic differences in COVID, both uh, infection and mortality and long-term disability. If we can start getting people to share this kind of information, we can answer fundamental questions of health. And starting with COVID, but COVID is not the end all of everything. There will be other health crises. There are other important ways we can contribute as social scientists to a broader understanding of health. And again, this is, this is one of my bugaboos. I want this data, I want it badly, but I want it to be consistent. I want to have agreement across sciences about what what means. And that's a process of discourse, it's a process of compromise, and it's a process of agreement. And that's, that's where we're working towards. I mean, we've made progress in areas, but there's a lot of work to go. Um, one of the nice things about coming at it from an interoperability perspective is we don't need to manage and control data. Again, we only need the variables and values. We'll do the rest of the work. If you don't measure something in the same way, you are not measuring the same thing. There will always be some kind of inherent bias in the responses. So our selling point is all we really want to do is make other people's research more discoverable to help publicize, facilitate, and make them famous. We're, we're ICPSR, we're facilitators. We don't need to be famous. We don't need to get all the glory. But every time somebody publishes a data set or publishes a study with one of my data sets, I'm happy. It makes me really happy to see people using our data because it's efficient, it's effective, and it's discoverable. And that's it. So thank you. That is our website. We just launched it. So visit it and give us ideas and concepts and thoughts. And now if we have questions, we can try to answer some of those. But thank you. Thank you for your time. This is fun.